I'm making this video to expose what's wrong in an argument that purportedly proves the impossibility for life to have either originated or evolved spontaneously. This argument asserts that if life were to originate or evolve spontaneously, it would, low, it would do so in violation of the laws of thermodynamics. Are the laws of thermodynamics players in the game of life? Of course they are, as there are several others, like kinetic theories in chemistry, theories of complexity and self-organization, information theory, and of course, almost everything within the realm of biology and biochemistry. However, the claim by some vivid and partisan supporters of the pseudosciences against mainstream science go much farther than that. They claim that the laws of thermodynamics, in fact, imply that undirected life is, in a word, impossible. Let's analyze their argument for what it says. Not an easy task, in fact, it's indeed very difficult to visualize what their concern is in practice. To the best of my knowledge, it all boils down to an assertion denoting this, a disturbing lack of knowledge and understanding of the laws of physics. For what I can gather, the argument just runs like this. Entropy can never decrease says the second law of thermodynamics, but entropy measures, disor measures disorder, it follows that disorder always increases. Therefore, life cannot emerge nor evolve because life is, an, is a very ordered state of matter. Ergo, the second law is incompatible with abiogenesis and Darwinian evolution. On a preliminary note, that same literal argument would also disprove seasonal storms, the formation of rocks and ice, the forms of snowflakes, the growth of any living species, the existence of orbits in the solar system, the existence of galaxies. In all such stances, order plays a fundamental role to determine the physical qualities at hand. There are two fundamental mistakes in the argument. Let's start off with the first one. There lies a fundamental misunderstanding of what entropy is. Entropy can be both measured in a laboratory and calculated from the theory of statistical mechanics. Taking some figurative descriptions too literally, many people have confused entropy, a measurable physical quantity with disorder, a noun of a subjective character. Granted, disorder can be defined formally by some in some context of science, but never as a direct emanation of the laws of thermodynamics. Entropy, in fact, you'll excuse me if I'll be technical, is a measure of the number of equivalent microscopic configurations that for a given system correspond to the same macroscopic thermodynamic state. Does that sound to you as if I said disorder? Okay, it's time to specify what the second law, law does say. There exist several equivalent formulations. We'll choose one that directly involves entropy and which is, is so dear to pseudosciences enthusiasts. Take a system that is closed and is also thermally isolated. For example, have some particles in a box whose walls are not permeable to energy exchange. Think of a perfect thermos. No transfer of heat can therefore occur from its side to outside or nor vice versa. Incidentally, the universe is widely understood to behave as a closed and isolated system. For these systems, I stress, for these systems which are both closed and thermally isolated, entropy can only either increase or remain constant in time. If the system is in a state that is not in equilibrium, the entropy will increase gradually at the, until it reaches equilibrium. Several examples falsify the concept that entropy literally means disorder. We'll take one example. There exists in nature some systems that schematically behave in a very similar way to having billiard balls wandering into a box. Note that the system is as if it's thermally isolated, therefore we expect the entropy to increase. What is the state of maximum entropy? Well, if you have only few balls, we could say that the entropy increases when the ball, balls look more randomly distributed than not. But what if you try to put a large number of balls into the box? Well, guess what? To attain maximum entropy, the balls must take over a more ordered configuration than one that is utterly disordered. The second law holds the entropy must increase for closed and isolated system, but it isn't true that entropy always and literally means disorder. Case closed, maybe, but we have just started with the demolition. Let's move on to a much more profound misunderstanding of thermodynamics. Go back for an instant to the formulation of the second law presented earlier. 
Remember, we did specify that the system must be closed and thermally isolated for the law of maximum entropy to make any, zen, any sense. But what happens if we do a walls of the box allow energy transfer, like heat can be furnished or dissipated? And what do you think? Do you think the Earth is permeable to energy transfer? Let's see then what happens now to the laws of thermodynamics. The law of a maximum entropy really doesn't help much now. There is another helpful quantity, it is called the free energy. It's our substitute for the entropy if we want to make any use of thermodynamics. The laws of thermodynamics all put together tell us that in this case the free energy can only remain constant or decrease in time. At equilibrium, after enough time has passed, the free energy will have reached its minimum value pretty much in the same fashion as before the entropy to reach its maximum. If you believe in the laws of thermodynamics for isolated systems, like the law of maximum entropy, I sincerely hope you do also believe in this law of minimum free energy for non-isolated systems, because it contains the second law. As you can see, the free energy has, a as, has, a va has variables, the internal energy and the entropy, with opposite signs. Even if the entropy decreases, overall the free energy can still decrease if the internal energy goes down by the appropriate amount. For systems that exchange energy with an external source, source, like the Earth with the Sun, entropy can decrease without any law of thermodynamics being violated. We notice several possible combinations that may in principle all be consistent with the expected decrease in free energy. Energy down but entropy up, energy down and entropy down, energy up but entropy up. The control parameter is the temperature T. Note also that energy and entropy aren't independent, they are, they are interrelated. Given that this scenario is so complex, how exactly do the fans of pseudoscience think they can derive their conclusions so easily? Precisely, precisely, what configurations do they have in mind that are necessarily involved in life's origin and evolution on Earth that violate this law? I'm confused. It's not that simple, is it? Yes, the free energy must go down. But if the internal energy goes down a lot, the entropy can still become smaller with time without any violation of any, of any physical law of nature. Yes, the free energy... Okay, guys. Um, we are almost over. Hold on. If we look at open systems, like those we deal with every day, we are actually dealing with transformations that do not occur at constant volume, but at constant pressure. These transformations are in fact those most likely to be involved in the processes of life. We can use another free energy that is called the Gibbs free energy. The Gibbs free energy must also decrease in attaining equilibrium. It is very similar to the previous free energy. One just imagines to substitute the internal energy with a quantity called enthalpy, which is somewhat similar to the internal energy. We does make a parallel. The Gibbs free energy must decrease, but this can happen with either decreasing enthalpy or decreasing entropy, or sometimes both. We can draw the same scheme as before. See, again we can have entropy decreasing in time, but also entropy decreasing in time. So here is the first step that I suggest that our heroes take to prove that the laws of thermodynamics are at odds with the spontaneous processes of life. We could start by proving that the only conceivable processes in life all necessarily involve transformations that lead to some increase in the Gibbs free energy at some macros macroscopic level. A hint, prove that it is necessary for any process related to, the, to life's origin and evolution that the entropy must necessarily decrease while at the same time the entropy must necessarily increase. Well, I guess most pseudosciences aficionados at this point might be wondering what the entropy actually is. Here's the definition might help in your proof. Yes, the Gibbs free energy does decrease. In fact, that's how you get ice from water, a disordered state that becomes easily ordered. Finally, a remark. The whole point about the laws of thermodynamics is that they apply on large and different scales. That's how you have a universe whose overall entropy increases, but locally you have all sorts of interesting phenomena with galaxies, stars, planets, rocks, chemicals. But even farther than that, locally you have what are called fluctuations. You can also have locally what some would call an apparent violation of thermodynamics if it regards isolated and individual events.